Um, today's scripture reading comes from Daniel 11, 29 to 45. And we are going to have it up here, but if you're looking for it in your Bible, again, that's Daniel 11, 29 to 45. Daniel 11, 29 to 45. Hear the word of the Lord. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the holy covenant. Forces for him from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery, and some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white, until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. A god whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many, and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall come into countries, and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab, and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, and he shall come to his end with none to help him. The word of the Lord. Church, it's great to open up God's word with you this morning. As Dan mentioned, I just want to take time to say thank you to all the spiritual mothers to me in this church. Whether you're young or old, many of you have prayed for me, and I don't know where I would be without that. So on this Mother's Day, I just want to thank all the ladies who are gathered here for who you are, for how God has made you. Now, in the next couple of Sundays, we will wrap our series in the book of Daniel. Today, we are diving into chapter 11. Following week, we will dive in chapter 12. But before we decided to do this series, all the pastors, Bill and Shep, and I got together to talk about what to do with the second half of the book of Daniel, because there's all kinds of language of allegory, future prophecy. But we are like, this is God's word. Let's preach through it. So I'm like, all right, we are going to do it. So we are doing it. And yet, so as you go along, I have pastor friends across the nation. So when I call them, when I talk to them, I'm telling them, hey, Jim, what are you guys doing at the church? I said, oh, we are walking through Daniel. Daniel? They were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, it's entirety? So I'm like, yeah. Number one question I get from them is, what are you going to do with chapter 11? <laughs> I'm not, it's God's word. We are doing it. Deep down, I'm thinking, oh, maybe Bill or Shep will preach this one. <laughs> Well, it looks like the lottery has me here. It's a very complicated chapter. <laughs> As I'm studying, this one commentator says regarding Daniel 11, he says, 
It might be treated in Bible classes, but we do not see how it can be used in a sermon or sermons. <laughs> That's encouraging. Another commentator said, in the first 35 verses, there are 125 prophecies. And the great reformer who kind of solidified the Protestant Reformation movement, John Calvin, he himself wrote over 100 pages in this chapter alone. So all that to say, fasten your seatbelt, church. We are going to go get them. No, deep down, I am so thankful that we are doing it. The reason I'm saying that at the end of the day, as, as we're studying to walk us together in this glorious chapter, in the end, it gave me great reassurance. Things might fall apart, but for believers, it's going to be okay. That's your destiny. That's who you are in Christ. I hope you take heart in that. So about a decade ago, when I was pastoring in Dallas in a church plant, and also I was doing my master's study in Dallas Seminary. Now, uh, there's a Bible class called like Biblical Theology. If I can simplify that, that class mainly, you study the Bible book by book, learn about the Bible. And there was this class called the Systematic Theology, which means you just study Bible by its topic. So first year, you learn about intro to theology, and then you learn about such as study of salvation. How does one get saved? Study of sin, what sin is all about. Study of church, whether you call it Hamar theology, ecclesiology, all that, soteriology. The very last class, it's a total of seven classes I remember, very, very last class for seniors were a class called eschatology, which is what study of end times, prophecy, and all that. For me, I'm the man who seeks understanding. I have to figure this thing out. So my freshman year, as soon as I took the intro to theology classes, freshman year, what, guess what class I took? The study of end times. I had to know. I had, I'm very curious about how this world will unfold. To this day, that could be my soapbox. Yeah, what I got away from the class, was still one of my favorite classes, but the more and more I learn, I only realized how much I don't know. And this, at this point, I don't even know how much I don't know, actually, quite frankly. <laughs> so in a sense, the studying of this kind of prophecy and end times requires great humility for us to know that, God, you still reign on the throne, and I am okay with that. May that be the posture of your heart as we dive in. So this kind of, talk, we are about to talk about apocalyptic literature, what's going to happen, end time, and prophecy, the Daniel is predicting what the future is going to look like. This kind of sermon requires a sermon before a sermon. So let me give you briefly two points, how to read apocalyptic literature and how to study them. Number one, don't lose the sight of forest because you get stuck in a tree. Let me say that. Don't lose the sight of forest because you get stuck in a tree. One of the cautions or dangers of this book, especially the second half of the book of Daniel, and particularly chapter 11, is that you get so preoccupied with every single nitty-gritty details that you miss the its entire main point that God is trying to communicate to you. In other words, there's a reason why angel came to Daniel to disclose what's going to take place. But we are trying to put the puzzle together one by one by one, and you're like, whoa, what is this all about? For example, when you uh, read the parables in the New Testament, uh, Jesus is using that parable to drive one main singular point. Sure, in that parable, there are a lot of sub-points, but those are not necessarily there up for interpretation, but those are there to drive the one point that Jesus is trying to make. There is reason why Daniel, through the angel, is disclosing what is going to take place. So in a moment, as you walk through details, you'll be like, what is this happening? That's okay. I hope you get the one big central message. Second, that's how you read apocalyptic literature. Second thing that you need to know about prophecy and apocalyptic literature is that history is not only cyclical, but also linear. Let me say it one more time. The history is not only cyclical, but also linear. What I mean by that, you are soon about to see the basic pattern. You saw in the book of Judges, you see it here too. 
all the kings and kingdoms rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, one after, one after, and one after. Basically, it's like a dog chasing his own tail, going after. Well, have you ever seen a dog trying to bite his own tail? It's all cyclical, spinning around. It feels like, what's the point? Yes, history is cyclical in a sense. In a book of Judges, kings rise, they take the throne, they get corrupt, God ousts them. And they seek new king, kings get corrupt, the cycle continues. It seems like that's the story of the Bible, yes. However, history is not only cyclical but linear, that every story in the Bible, in the end, the Bible is a one storyline that drives from point A to point B. It seems like cyclical, but it's moving somewhere. In the end, as all the evils and kings and kingdoms rise and fall, rise and fall, History is still moving, that the story of the Bible moves from A to B at the end of the day. Wicked will fall, and the redeemed will rise. That's your hope that you can cling on to that. So when you look at that, sometimes just a bunch of apocalyptic literature gets really confusing. But this is written to give us insight into God's promise and the pattern at work in history. It is there to propel our hope about the future. When you see all the wicked rise and fall, it's really disheartening you're about to see sometimes. Yet story, God is still writing the story that that there is a great arc storyline that you are about to see. So today at the end of the day, Sheldon, if Jesus reigns at the command center of your life, if the primary meaning of your life is based on what he has done for you at the cross, and you can rest now. You will be all right. All the world will rise and fall, but you will stand still in the name of the Lord. May that hope ride deep within our heart. So three things as you dive in. First, we'll learn about the rise and fall of the kingdoms. You're about to see that in this chapter 11. Second, you will see the rise and fall of Antichrist. Yes, I am talking about the Antichrist, the arch enemy of God. And so... Rise and fall of the kingdoms, king and kingdoms, rise and fall of Antichrist. And third, the fall and rise of the redeemed. That's the storyline of Daniel 11. And this is not only the storyline of this Daniel, but it's the entire storyline of the Daniel. So as we dive in, Shelton, do you remember last week what we said? We said chapter 10 through 12. It's one final vision that God gives to Daniel. And chapter 10, we studied last week, is about kind of prologue, Daniel's impression. Oh, angel showed up to me. I am terrified. This was what I thought of. But chapter 10, we talked about the reality of spiritual warfare in the heavenly realm, how that affects even our reality. Now, what is that vision actually about is what we are about to study in chapter 11. And this is one complicated chapter. So if you want to understand what is happening, let me give you a simplified outline. Kind of verse 1 through 35 that we just saw here, 1 through 35, in a sense, talks about the future event from Daniel's point of view. Not necessarily our point of view. This refers to the intertestamental period. When I say intertestamental period, Daniel's written about 6th century B.C., but this is predicting the events, what's going to happen in 2nd, 3rd century B.C. before Jesus comes. What people call it 400 years of silence from the last prophet Malachi to Jesus. Angel is showing what's going to take place at that time. So 1 through 35 is that. And 36 all the way to the end is future prophecy even to us. In other words, this is talking about the last battle when Antichrist released the great Armageddon and all that crazy thing will take place at the time. So that's even future to us. To Daniel, it's both of them are future, but us who live 2,500 years after, those are even future for us. So this chapter contains one of the most unusual compositions. In one sense, it's extremely detailed how it was fulfilled. And I'll show you little by little. But on the other sense, it's written in such a symbolic language who is king of south, who is the king of north, we'll dive in. If you don't follow, if you want to follow me, I think the best way to do it is to open the Bible up. Otherwise, this can get really detailed. But bear with me for the next 10 minutes or so. I'll walk through and then 
bring us to earth, bring us down to earth, about what the point of all this is about. So first, the rise and fall of the kingdoms. Look verse 2. And now I'll show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall rise in Persia, and four shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up against all the kingdom of Greece. What is he talking about, church? We studied the book of Daniel its entirety. First, Israelites were taken into captivity by the first kingdom that came was Babylonian kingdom. And now when Daniel writes this letter, it's by the time of Persian kingdom. We study at the end of chapter 5, magical finger appears right on a wall. That was the last day of the Babylonian empire. And the Persian kingdom now has come in. So all Babylonian kingdom rose and fell. Now Persian kingdom is just strong and mighty. They are reigning strong. But guess what? It only lasts one verse. Verse 3. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. Who is this king referring to? Alexander the Great. The great kingdom has come in. And he does whatever he wants. If you study history, he was one of the greatest kings. There's a reason why his name is Alexander the Great. As great as he is, he does whatever he wills, he said. Guess what? He rises, he lasts only one verse. Look, verse 4. As soon as he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others beside this. He said even Alexander's kingdom will be divided, and it, it's not going to go to his posterity, his sons, but it goes to his general, his four rulers. His kingdom will be divided into. Do you see the pattern? Babylonian kingdom rose, mighty, powerful, built their own statue about how great they are. They fell. They come and go. Kings and rise and fall. Persian kingdom came mighty and powerful. Well, guess what? They are done away. Alexander the Great rose. He's done away too. Do you begin to see the pattern here? Verse 5 and 6. Then the king of the south shall be strong. Verse 6. Then south come to the king of the north to make an agreement. Who in the world is the king of south and the king of north? If you want to be technical, you don't have to remember this. But king of south is referring to Ptolemy's kingdom. And king of the north is referring to Seleucian. But more, if I can simplify that, basically, king of the south is referring to the leaders of Egypt. And the king of the north is referring to the rulers of Syria. Babylonian kingdom, check, come and gone. Persian kingdom, check, come and gone. Alexander the Great, Greek, come and gone. Now is the leaders of Egypt and Syria, another battle. So 6 through all the way 20 talks about all kinds of political and the military battle that took place between those two. Verse 6, you also saw that sometimes they married each other to have some peace with that bunch of things are happening you think this is done look verse 20 then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom but within a few days he shall be broken another kingdom rise and fall rise and fall none of them will be everlasting finally it's over nope just kidding look verse 21 in his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. Now the focus shift specifically to the one king of Syria, the Norse, historically identified as Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now the, his legacy is written all the way down to 35. Uh, it talks about his brutality, how he rose to power, and how he actually persecuted the Jews, how he made a bunch of profanity in the temple. Now, having said all that, you got to see the rise and pattern fall of the kingdom. Now, there are some group of people who say, you know what? This is too accurate to be prophecy. This cannot be true. So we said it from the beginning that this book was written in 6th century BC 540 by Daniel. But there are some people who deny miracle and supernatural say, there's no way for human to know all this. This was written actually first century BC. They are looking back at the event and writing allegorical language. Why? Because they don't believe in the power of God. You know what? To us who believes in omniscience, God who knows all things, it's hard, church, to see all the kingdoms and rise and fall. Why is it hard? I mean, it's 
It's just history lesson. So it's like, oh, yeah, what, what's hard about it? Well, think about it. Every time kingdoms rise and fall, do you know how many innocent people die out of result? War is one of the most inhumane things. Sometimes in the war, people don't even know why they have to shoot at each other. It's an absolutely awful thing. And we are saying, this is terrible. God, are you, are you even there? Are you in control of all things? Yes, our God is still so much in control that even in 6th century B.C., he can foresee what is going to happen in the future. Just because we cannot understand all the details, that does not mean God is not present, church. So to us who believe in powerful God, history, the prophecy, do you know what prophecy is in the end to us? Prophecy is simply history written in advance. Because our God knows all things to disclose that. Nothing catches our God by surprise. He knew all this, the kingdoms rise and fall even far before. It's hard. When I read my mind, this kind of warfare is not only for that times, but even in our modern times too, right? It's not too long ago when Holocaust happened. They killed so many innocents. And I don't know whether you're familiar with it. I don't know whether you're familiar with what's called as Asian Holocaust, that during the World War II, this one empire killed twice as many people as Nazis did. Absolutely awful. And sometimes, can I dial it down to where we are today, church? I read an article recently. No, I don't even have to read an article. I heard that our nation, here's everybody's extremely cynical and apathetic, that in November, we have two same guys who's going to run for the office, and people are tired of it. And we're like, where is hope in all that? Let me dial it down to your own very functional level in your, where you are today. Sometimes you see all kinds of evil prosper in your places. You're like, how should I say this, church? To the degree that you share emotional and relational proximity to somebody, and you know you're kind of better than them, but when they, you see them prosper, to the degree that you share relational and emotional proximity, or it will eat you up alive. You're like, God, where is justice? I know I'm better than that. Why doesn't my boss see me how hard I work? Why don't they know what I'm going? Why that person? Ah, oh, why, why do they get promoted and not me? Where is justice? Why do innocent get killed? Sometimes it's really hard to watch how history unfolds in your personal life, in your micro storm, in your own life, to this cosmic battle that has taken place and will take place. Then we say, God, where are you? And Shalom, take heart just because you don't understand. That does not mean God is absent. He knows. He knows what you're going through today. Take heart in that. History seems like just rise and fall of a cyclical, but God is still writing the story. It's driving from point A to point B. That in the end, the wicked will fall and the redeemed will rise. Take heart today, church. He sees you. Second thing we learn here, the rise and fall of Antichrist. Now, if you look at the, at the end of the chapter, passage that we read, look verse 36. This is now. Oh, well, let me read 36. And the king shall do as he wills. The king will do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. Did you see the do as he wills? That very phrase, do as he wills, in verse 36, was also repeated in verse 3 and 16. But that refers to earthly king. Alexander the Great did whatever he willed. When you are that powerful, you can do whatever you want, I guess. Terrible. Verse 16, the kings of north and south did whatever they wanted. But this, they did whatever he willed. This person, it's a whole new level. I mean, you thought the world wars, all the shootings happening here and there, all the injustice, all the killings and murders were terrible. This will be a bloodbath one day. I don't know my human heart can take it at that time. Look, verse 44, what happens? News from east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. Yes, this is talking about the one who's going to mock even God of all gods, our Lord and Savior Jesus. 
This Antichrist will be the arc enemy of God. And there will be one gory day that I get a little cringe by thinking about that. But where is our hope in that? Guess what? As all the kingdoms rose and fell, look just one next verse, verse 45. Even the Antichrist comes at expiration date. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. There will be nobody who can stand our God, the Almighty. Church, as much as it is mind-boggling, even the ultimate evil Antichrist, who will bring all people to destruction, perhaps in the great day of Armageddon in Megiddo, there will be massive destruction will happen that day. But even the evil will come to an end. That's the storyline that we can hope. Now, what about us then? As I mentioned earlier, church, that hurts, right? As all the kingdoms rise and fall, a lot of innocents will be killed. That's a horrific things. It's unfair. Where is our hope in that? How do we live our days then with knowing that this kind of things will happen? Let me give you two things. The, the, we will fall, but we will rise. The fall and rise of the redeemed. First thing you need to know, have clear expectations. What I mean by that? Read the first verse of chapter 12. What does it say? At the time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was nation till that time. I'm reading. Wait a second. Did you read what, hear what I just said? Michael. Who's Michael? The archangel, the number one chief angel army of God. He's going to come. But guess what? There shall be a time of trouble. Whoa, 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 whoa. If the God of angel army is with us, I am expecting walk in the park. They better deliver me. What your expectations should be, church? Even in God's presence, suffering may still endure. So just because you are going through such a hard time today, church, that does not mean God is absent in your life. Even when God is near, suffering may not disappear. So today, Chelton, sometimes there's wrong kind of people say, when you believe in Christ, oh, your life will be wonderful. You will have the biggest house in your neighborhood. Oh, your, your, your retirement fund might double because you've given. No. Even when God is near, suffering may still last for a while. So our hope, Chelton, it's not found in the absence of suffering, but in the very presence of God. It's such a hard thing to say. It's personally such a hard thing to say because to the degree that you have suffered, church, you know that emotional heartache that tore you apart that you couldn't even bear. But didn't you also know that God was right there with you to carry you through that moment? I, quite frankly, I don't pray for God. Don't, don't give me that. It's too much. But oftentimes, that is the very time that God teaches us to trust Him and to rely on Him and to trust in His sovereign plan. When we see all kinds of evil and injustice, it's so easy to lose heart. I am tempted to lose heart when that happens. Like, God, why does all this evil prosper? Why this kind of injustice happen? I don't understand. But I still trust in His goodness that even the Antichrist will have expiration date. And even when they're suffering, that does not mean that God is not near. Even when Archangel Michael is here, there will be trouble in the world that the world has never seen before. So have proper expectation about your life. So as a Christian church, I'm convinced that Christians are far more happier and far more sadder than anybody else in the world. Christians are far more joyful because we know how the storyline is driving to. In the end, as terrible as the world is, we will have happy endings. So you should be far more joyful than any other people. But you should be far more grievous too. This world is not what it's meant to be. That's, this is not how God has designed. But injustice and suffering prolong, it breaks our heart. But do not lose heart. So have a clear expectation. Second thing you should know. Salvation belongs to the Lord and Lord God alone. Salvation belongs to Him. Now... <laughs> Isn't this entire book kind of unfair? Have you, do you remember how we began our series, church? 
Let me read verse, chapter 1, verse 1 and 1 and 2, how this began. Israelites are living happy life. Awesome. Verse 1, in the third, first chapter, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Israelites are living a life, and all of a sudden, this Babylonian kingdom just takes them, snatch out, and takes them into slavery. How terrible is that? Now, I've lived in Pennsylvania four years, and I come to realize that Pennsylvania and this area, Montgomery County, people don't move. They, they are born here. They die here. <laughs> so many of us are here forever. Can you imagine if all of a sudden somebody comes and pluck you out of Montgomery County and place you in North Korea? You're like, God, where are you? I, to us, oh, yeah, Israelites are taken into captivity. Imagine it for yourself. It would be horrific. You're like, God, how could you ever love my place? But guess what? You think Israelites were just helpless, a victim by these kind of kings? What does one, two say? The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Even in their exile, God was still sovereign. The Lord gives and the Lord takes it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was God. We don't understand why. But just because we don't understand, that does not mean God does not have a good reason. God led Israel into wilderness. And it will be him who will deliver them out of their trouble today. In the end, salvation belongs to God and God alone. Do you believe that, church? Church, we live in such a celebrity culture that we are constantly prone to give our hopes away. Just in the matter of a few months when November comes, you will be tempted to give your ultimate hope to the Republican candidate or the Democratic candidate. Don't do that. Hope do not belong to them. The one who sits in the throne is far greater than the one who will sit in that Oval Office. Your hope is not found in the political nation of the world, political parties, or even in our nation. Can I say that? Rise and fall. America may rise. America may fall. I don't know what the future holds. Every World War cycle, new superpower comes. Who knows what's going to happen? But we will be constantly tempted to put our hope in that. And can I even say this? Church, don't put your hope in church leaders. Salvation do not belong to me. Salvation belongs to God and God alone. Church, do not put your hope in your bank account. That's not enough to carry you through that. We are constantly tempted. Oh, we have this much money. Oh, we'll be all right. See how it falls. Those are never enough. Don't trust and hope in your reputation as if that will carry you. That will not cut. In the end, it is God who is powerful enough to deliver us. That's the lesson that we learn through the book of Daniel, that our God reigns and he reigns supremely over all things. Do not give away. Do not give up your hope so easily. Put him and him alone that unifies us in the name of our Savior. So if somebody asked you today, so Jin, you said in the end, there will be fall, yet the rise of the redeemed. If somebody asked, how do you know that you will rise then? Um, in this terrible world that has happened, that will happen, and take Christ will come and all that. How do you know that you will rise? I heard one pastor put it this way. If any of your answer begins by saying, oh, because I, even because I have believed, even, even because I have faith, who is the one that caused you to believe that? If any of your answer begins with I, you are missing the mark. Have you thought about it? <laughs> Thief on the cross, you know, the one who hung left and right of Jesus, this one thief asked Jesus, hey, remember me when you get to paradise. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. So he dies, he goes to heaven. Can you imagine? People will be like, oh, you're here. How did you get here? Have you read the Bible? he will be like, what's the Bible? <laughs> what, you don't know Daniel 11, what Daniel 11 says? I don't know what Daniel is. Have you prayed in your life? he was maybe last 20 minutes of my life. And then we're like, why are you here then? His only answer came from, well, the man on the middle cross told me that I'll be with him in paradise. That's your hope, church. It's not about the merit that you can bring. We always want to work and earn our name, our value, our success, our reputation. None of them is powerful enough to save you. Salvation belongs to our God and him alone. 
our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus, he will come and destroy all the evil in the world, and we shall rise with him one day. That is your hope. Can you bank on that? So church, as we wrap our time today, I kind of want to end it differently than how I normally do it. Now, if you believe what we have been talking about, that our hope is found in crucified and risen Savior Jesus, we are about to read historic confession together called Heidelberg Confession, Catechism written in 1563 for all Protestant churches. If you believe that, I want you to read it out loud with me. It's a question and answer form. But if you got no idea what I'm talking about, who is this? You want a middleman on the cross? What, there were three? Who, who's the middle guy there? Who's Jesus? If you got no idea, I still want you to say it with me, read it out loud with me. But as you say, God, don't you want this kind of hope? None of you, even your family cannot save you. Don't you want them who's powerful enough to save you from this cosmic evil? Ask him, God, I want to know you. Show me who you are. May that be your prayer, because who knows, our God may be calling you today. So will you respond to that? So let me ask a question, and then we all will recite these answers together. Heidelberg Catechism, question one. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. All God's people say together, amen. Let's pray together. God, that is our hope. Yet, O oh Lord, we confess, borrowing from the prayer of one pastor, Lord, we worry because we forget your wisdom. We resent because we forget your mercy. We covet because we forget your beauty. <laughs> we sin because we forget your holiness. God, we fear, I fear, because we forget your sovereignty. God, when our hearts are prone to panic and worry and despair, you always remember us. So today, help us to remember you. Bring our hearts home. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.